Welcome to the Happy Mindset, episode 153. Today's episode is called La Melancholie. Today I'm going to talk around melancholy. Just going to explore this. It's not something that I have taught too much about. It's been something that I've I've explored, but it's not something that I've consciously really thought about the purpose of melancholy in my life, how how it's actually helped me, it served me, and how it wasn't serving me before. So I was looking into like the definition there of melancholy, just to get a distinction in my mind between melancholy and sadness. And I, the distinction that I saw was just the word pensive. And that's what I've always felt with the melancholy that differentiated that differentiated that experience for me from sadness. I feel with sadness, there's not really a pensiveness to it for me. And that's not a bad thing. It's just an acceptance that I feel sad about something. It's just an acceptance of that emotion. Where I find with the, the slight distinction in the melancholy is that I've always felt there was like a pensiveness underneath it, that if I knew how to engage with it, if I knew how to use it, it could actually serve a purpose and help me in my life. So I would say looking back in my life, there's been an underpinning of melancholy in my life that I didn't really know why it was there, didn't make any sense to me. And I think even some people picked up on it, that there was kind of a sadness to me. And when I had that, I had that situation once where somebody actually pointed it out to me and I knew it. I knew that there, that what she was saying was correct, but I couldn't articulate, even though I was trying, I couldn't articulate why is there a sadness to myself. So as I've moved forward with things, I've used melancholy, melancholy, that feeling of melancholy, Kali, to help me to create. Because it gives me like a deeper, it gives me a deeper connection to what I'm doing. Because there's there's a, because melancholy is a difficult feeling to work through if you're not working with it. You can just sit in the background and it'll just manifest as you're sad about things, but you don't know why you're sad. As I've been working with it, I've realized that, uh, I gradually kind of realized that the sadness in my life was just, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking a lot for myself. I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable in myself. And then I wasn't expressing any of that stuff either. I was too afraid of the potential ridicule and criticism for me being me. That that led to just a sadness that I, I didn't feel like I could be me. I think that's a lot of what the melancholy was underpinning there. And the melancholy for me was looking back on it. It was just a, uh, a signal that there's something different. There's something more from life you can get if you work with this, if you pay attention to this, if you can yeah, work with it rather than where I, I was in a state of not knowing how to engage with the melancholy in a creative way, in a way that would lead to progress in my life. So there's a TEDx talk or a TED talk that I'm going to link to this video. It's about the history of melancholy, which I found quite interesting. It's about five minutes long, it goes through a brief kind of history of melancholy, how 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 we use how we think about melancholy. It talked about the Greeks and their perception of melancholy. It talks a little bit about this uh, an engineering guy. I think he called what did he call it? Uh, I don't know, but his his kind of premise was that he wants to create a world where melancholy and sadness don't exist. And that gets me thinking about life in, I suppose this is quite relevant right now. We're going collectively, we're going through a lot of turmoil with the pandemic and we're having to sit with our feelings and thoughts a lot more. There's no escaping for me. Some, a world where there is no sadness or there's no emotions that can be challenging. I think you lose a lot of depth to life if you're not having a wide range of emotions to your life and even in that video i feel sometimes actually the because it's, it's there's no clear cut answer how to deal with emotions in a, in a way that serves you you have to think about things even in that video it mentioned about our language the language we use around feelings and sensations and life experiences that are difficult so he mentioned in some cultures you'll have the word heartbreak, which we'd have in our culture as well. When somebody goes through uh, a relationship breakup or somebody dies or 
something that's very traumatic and difficult to deal with. Heartbreak is a word that we that can be used in some cultures, and in other cultures, they might use the phrase a bruised heart. So there's a there's a there's there's a, an influence that a language can have in how you think about what you're going through, the feeling. Because with the heartbreak, in my mind, that would feel like you're you're broken to pieces. Whereas with the bruised heart, it feels like it feels like on your body, whenever you get hit, you you experience a bruise, but you know it's temporary. It's sore, but you know it's going to heal. Whereas it's more difficult for me to imagine me being broken into a thousand pieces. How I'm going to piece that together? That's diff- more difficult for me to conceptualize that, and it would it would make me more averse to acknowledging that I'm going through heart heartache heartbreak. It's just, uh, I think these things, I think language becomes, I think the less conscious you are about this stuff, the more important the unconscious things you say about your feelings and emotions and life itself become. I think when you're conscious around this stuff, the language doesn't hold as much weight because you're thinking about this stuff, you're thinking about how is this relating to how I'm perceiving this. Because with melancholy, because I didn't see, I didn't see a purpose for it. I, t- I think culturally, there's this perception that you need to fix somebody when they're sad. That's kind of the feedback we get as children. It's innocent, like, but it does have an effect on the psyche and on the person growing up. That whenever you do feel sadness, you're 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 asked why are you feeling sad, as if it's a bad thing to feel sad, and we need to fix this straight away. So. It's very nuanced, I feel, there, I feel. Because you can get the message that it's not okay to feel sad about things. And when you do feel sad, we need to fix it straight away. We can't allow it to... We can't allow ourselves to move through that process in the natural way it's supposed to move through. Like, for me today now, what I work more on is acknowledging when I'm disappointed acknowledging when I'm feeling frustrated, acknowledging when I'm feeling sad and not trying to push that out of my experience, just allowing that to be there. Even if it feels uncomfortable, a lot of times it does feel uncomfortable, but it does get better over time. I, I do feel, and they touched on it in that TEDx video, TED video, that you, you lose an appreciation of the beautiful things in life when you can't accept the difficult things in life. I think they talked about in terms of nature that accepting that trees leaves off trees die and and they disintegrate allows you to appreciate when they're vibrant and alive that's the contrast there another thing the melancholy helps me with is to to allow me to read a wide range of books so recently i'm reading a book called mad in america it's recommended by a friend it's an interesting book it's an eye-opening book it's also a difficult read because you see the evolution of psychiatry. Obviously, it's one, it's one book. There's a lot of sides to the story. But reading that story, you see how influential, how much influence people of authority have over other people in life who are more vulnerable on the more vulnerable side. It's very stark in that book that you've got people who, are, who aren't comfortable in themselves, who do have problems in their life who are in a very vulnerable state and there's very little compassion actually coming from that book very little really trying to get at the root cause of what's disturbing these people and there's more of a a path to seeing them dehumanizing these people rather than actually trying to be compassionate and trying to understand how do we create solutions that are serving these people rather than just controlling these people so that's a very difficult read. So I find with the acceptance of difficult emotions like sadness, melancholy, it allows you to actually see see that stuff, not brush it under the carpet. So if you're a person who's inclined to not want to have sadness, not want to have melancholy in your life, then you'll tend to avoid stuff like that. You won't read books like that because you'd have to be really, really deluded to read a book like that and not realize that there's some very dark places that in the past and the world still is there's some very dark corners of the art today 
even that book they talked about eugenics, eugenics in America. And just I suppose even looking at Germany and how that kind of unfolded. It's 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 so difficult to, to talk about this stuff, but it's I feel in my life it's important to read around this stuff, to not have a naive view on life, to actually read that and realize that I can feel whatever is coming up for me here. But I don't have to read this in a way that in a way that makes me rationalize that my country and the Western world is good. Because that was half the problem in the book I read I when I was kind of reading it. I was noticing that as people we have a need to feel good about ourselves. And the way we often engage in behaviors and engage in just bad behaviors, the way we can do that and still feel good about ourselves is our rationalizations. So we'll we'll rationalize something will to the extent that we make out that it's actually good for this person to be controlled and safe it's good for them they can't deal with freedom it's those types of rationalizations that are very destructive so again like the melancholy those type of emotions help me to actually read that and realize what's the errors in the ways here how is this happening how are these things happening and then i take a step back and i look at it in my own life I'm not going to be moralistic or self-righteous here. I realize that history is nuanced, and but we can definitely do better if we learn from the lessons of history. That's the way I kind of look at it, that I can learn. I can look at history, look at the dark sides of history, and look at the lessons. What are the, the lessons here? Like That was a core lesson I took away from that. Was it, was it was people are capable of doing things that don't feel good, that they don't feel is right, by justifying things, by making up rationalizations that make it sound good to them because of that basic need that we need to feel good about ourselves. So I look at that in my life too. Where am I doing that? So that's kind of, that kind of, that's kind of what helps me to, to be fair. And uh, another book I'm reading at the moment is Leonardo da Vinci. So I read that book and so I read those, I'm reading that book in parallel. So Madden America and Leonardo da Vinci's book. And Leonardo da Vinci's book is quite a thick book. It's by Isaac Walterson. It's about 500 pages. It's one of those books I'm just dipping in and out of. I'm not reading from start to finish. And the impression I got from Leonardo da Vinci in that book, the impression I'm getting so far, you, you get more of a, a human side to him. That he wasn't... Because when I, when I was in the education system reading about these, these great Renaissance artists and, and people like that, all you only get an, an insight into their work. There's no real focus on them as a person. And what I found is that when there's always there's a sole focus on the work, you don't. It, I suppose it, it puts them on a pedestal. So you're dehumanizing them in the way that you're making them a demigod, and they're not somebody that you can relate to. But when you read a book like that, you can start to see like the sides of Leonardo da Vinci that were. Difficult for him to deal with, like even reading the book, you realize how many unfinished pieces of artwork were there from him. He didn't finish everything he set out to do. And of course, there's, an ele- there's going to be an element for him as an artist that of disappointment, of the, the feelings there that of... There'd be feelings there for him, I would imagine, that a modern day creator would have. Like, if I do something, and I don't finish it, there's difficult feelings to deal with there that I didn't complete this or it didn't turn out how I wanted it to. So I would imagine something like that, even though he's done some, even though he's made a huge impact in the world, he would still have those human emotions. And that would, that's what I would imagine would go into the art in the first place. If he didn't have those emotions, there wouldn't be much depth to what he was doing. When it, when I'm reading that book, it clicks with me more about Sumato. So I can remember as a teenager in school being taught about Leonardo da Vinci, and that was one of the techniques. I had to memorize that. I had to memorize fumato was a technique that Leonardo da Vinci brought into existence, or that was the, that was a kind of innovation. But that didn't land with me at all. Like it's probably some of it's down to life experience, some of it's down to the way things are taught, focusing on focusing on words and facts rather than experiences. How did this actually shift society? 
Because the way I look at it today, this fumato is just my interpretation of things based on my own life experience. So, so that's the life experiencing there. But Sumato, he, he's adding shadows to the, the paintings. So for me, that depicts real life because we've got shadow sides to ourselves that can be in the shadows until we acknowledge them. And even in reality, in the real world, you'll notice that people walk around in the world, there's shadows. There's actually a shadow that we cast in the world. And that was, so they talked a little bit about Michelangelo. Michelangelo wasn't of that school of thought and he had very straight, rigid lines in his paintings. And just reading a little bit of Michelangelo, he seemed to be quite antagonistic. That's what I'm getting from the book. And he was quite antagonistic with people. He didn't seem to be as comfortable with himself as Leonardo. That's just what I, the impression I got from the book reading it. And for me, that would kind of manifest in the drawing, the very rigid straight lines, a rigid type of thinking there. But that's only a, that's, for me there, that could be true, that could be false. I don't know, different time, different era. But that gets me thinking about my own life. Where am I being rigid and where am I being a bit more in flow? That's the, so I look at the physical things I create, the physical things that I do and kind of, I look at that as a window into, maybe I'm being a bit too fluid there, maybe I'm a bit being too rigid there. I kind of play with that stuff. So before that would, I think that would get to me because again, I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with difficult emotions, like sadness, melancholy, uh, disappointment. I didn't want to feel those emotions. So I would kind of overanalyze the things I was doing wrong. So I could avoid those emotions. Again, this is all happening unconscious to me. But the more that I just kind of accept that, that that's, that's more of what's actually going on there. I can look at things more, a little bit more objectively, a little bit more objectively than, and work on things. But they're the main things I wanted to cover today about melancholy. And to also just give you an experience of talking something out. That's what I, that's how I feel I make progress in my life a lot of times is to start talking about something that I don't know where to begin. And even though it might, mightn't be fully coherent, it mightn't fully make sense all the time. It's something to just build on. So even in a technical side of things, that would be my approach with computer programming. That has been my approach with computer programming. That is an approach to computer programming where first of all, you're focused on making something functional and once something actually works, you know, it could be higgledy piggledy thrown together, get something to work. You've done it. It's the first time you're working on such a thing. You get it to work functionally. Then after that, when it finally works functionally, you can refine it. So that's even on a technical skills level, that's the way I would take this approach also. And it's getting at the core of the things that have bothered me in my life that I want to find resolution in myself and to also help other people find resolution or find some sort of a process that will help them find resolution around these things. A lot of it's the psychological flexibility to just t reframe, think about these emotions in different ways in a way that allows you to, to feel them and accept them. So I often find with the reframing, what I've seen over the years, People use reframing it as a way of avoidance, a way of, again, it, it'll tie back to what I mentioned there about the rationalizations. So we need to feel good about ourselves so we can make up rationalizations that allows us to behave in a ways that aren't particularly useful uh, in order to avoid emotions. So that's how, what you can do with reframing if you're not aware of it. But I use reframing as a way for me to actually feel emotions rather than avoid them because I realize that these emotions go nowhere. Well, that's what I that's what I that's what I get from my life now. But that's it anyway. If you would like to support the podcast, go over to happymindset.com. There's a membership option there if you want to join us in a group Zoom call once a month to help you with your creativity and to also support the podcast. Uh, it's five euro a month. If you want to join that, then you can check out my book on the website too. And that's it. So thanks again for listening, and I will speak to you on the next episode.